verses one to five, and I'll read that out now. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Lachlan. Um, well, as I begin, I just want to show you a photo. Uh, this is a photo of uh, my family. And uh, this was the day that we left to go to Namibia. Um, so this is us at the airport. And you can, uh, you can see, I think, etched on a few young faces there, a little bit of um, anxiety about the prospect of moving to another country. Uh, and there, there's a lot of things um, uh, to be worried about or scared about. Namibia is a place that's a lot like Australia. So people drive on the left-hand side of the road, they speak English. There's lots of things that are very similar, but there are enough things that are different that it takes some adjusting. So even though people spoke English, there were words that they used that I didn't know and phrases that I used that they didn't seem to understand. Uh, anybody who's ever had a South African tell them that they're gonna do something now realizes that now in South Africa has a different meaning to what it does in Australia. And if you really want something done in South Africa now, it's now, now, or now, now, now. Um, there are little subtle differences like that, that until you get on top of, they're just confusing. Um, everyone knows the importance of making a good first impression. So it's important how you greet people. So when we landed in Namibia, are we supposed to shake hands? Are we supposed to hug? Are we supposed to do the air kisses? And if so, how many and which side do you start on? And it's a disaster if you don't know how to greet people properly. Uh, it's hard to form relationships when it's like that. Uh, they've got shopping centers in Namibia, just like we have here, but we couldn't find everything that we were looking for in the shopping centers. The kinds of things that uh, we were used to weren't in the places that we were used to. They were called different things. The brands that we were used to weren't there. It, it was just, different enough to throw you off. We're trying a new schooling system for the kids and there are all kinds of things about their schooling system that to us just didn't make sense and they seemed inconsistent and, and it was a struggle to work out whether the kids were ever gonna actually learn anything at all. We didn't know how the banking system worked. We were struggling to get the internet connected. All these things we're wrestling with. And the place where we were living too, um, it wasn't in the safest part of town. And so we were told that it wasn't really safe to walk out of your house, that there were dangers kind of on the streets. And so you couldn't go mixing with people. Uh, and all of that unsettled us. And we weren't sure whether we were being careful or too careful or overreacting. And sometimes we weren't even sure to be honest what was legal and what was not legal. Now that's a bizarre experience, isn't it? And you couldn't possibly imagine what it was like for us, could you? Well, of course you can, <laughs> because actually that's what all of us have been going through for the last four weeks or so. That kind of disorientation where all those kinds of things we were used to suddenly got changed just enough to knock us off balance. Just think of all the new words that you've learnt this year. Who knew what a novel coronavirus was? Uh, COVID-19 hadn't even been invented as a word. The concept of flattening the curve or social distancing, all these kinds of things we've learnt in the last month or two. Uh, you no longer greet one another in the way that you used to, handshakes and hugs are out, right? Uh, the shopping centres we rely on so much have run out of the things that are always in the place where we expect them to be. And we're not used to that. Uh, anyone who's got kids at home knows the chaos and tantrums that go along with trying to do schooling uh, in a household where there's work from home going on as well. Um, you no doubt have sorted through internet issues and maybe you are still right as you're trying to listen to me sorting through 
internet is, things that we wouldn't have thought of were kind of part of our experience, but are now overwhelming us. And we are constantly having to reassess what is good and right and appropriate. And some of us for the first time in our lives are not even sure what's legal and what's not legal. It's odd, isn't it? It's really odd. And even though you and I don't know one another, uh, perhaps at all, or certainly not well, I'm gonna take a pretty fair guess and say that you have been going through this disorienting experience and you are tired, uh, exhausted, and feeling like you're not being very productive. And what I wanna to say to you is if that's what you're feeling, that's normal for anybody who's going through culture shock. That's what it's like. We only work at a fraction of our normal capacity. As Margie and I, my, my wife and I were preparing to go to Africa, we spent years looking forward to it. And we spent six months getting specific training on how to deal with culture shock and things like that. And we were really looking forward to going. And even though that was true, it was still exhausting and still disorienting. And we still uh, felt like we weren't doing the kinds of things we wanted to be able to do that we used to be able to do just a couple of weeks ago. Now, no one asked you if you wanted to go into lockdown. This is not something you were looking forward to. This is not something you'd been planning for and nobody gave you any training and yet you are thrown into it. That's what we're going through. That's what culture shock is. And all of us are living it. And there are two elements to culture shock that I think are really important to, uh, to grab a hold of and will help us as we just uh, think about the Bible in a minute. The first element is that culture shock always involves suffering. Suffering to the extent that it's any kind of experience that you didn't want, didn't ask for, and is unpleasant. It's uncomfortable, it's painful, it's frustrating. And we have lived in a culture that prizes comfort, that prizes being able to do things on my terms. And because of that, this shock is a real shock. It goes to the heart of how we have operated and what we have seen to be good and right. And there's also grief. So suffering and grief. Um, and there are so many layers to the kinds of griefs that we are going through at the moment. Uh, even if you've not yet lost a loved one to the disease, uh, you have lost opportunities. Uh, some of you will have been looking forward to going to events, to weddings or uh, baptisms, uh, birthday parties, engagements, um, graduations. There are all different kinds of things that we would have expected quite reasonably, that we've lost. And a lot of our freedoms that we're very used to, we've lost. And every one of those is another added layer of grief. And dealing with that grief is complicated. Today, I wanna to quickly share with you um, some things that I have found that have helped me as I've navigated culture shock over the last 12 years or so, and taught other people about culture shock. Some of these things are from uh, uh, psychologists and sociologists uh, and others, the richest ones, are from the Bible. Um, as I start, uh, let, me, let me just share with you a line from that passage that Lachlan read out a moment ago. And I want to just ask you, how well does this sit with you, this line? Is this true for you? Is it true that we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope? The idea of glorying in or boasting in your sufferings is, is just odd, isn't it? But if you look closely at the words on the screen there, uh, what he's saying is that it's the reason, the reason why we, it's because we know that suffering produces a chain reaction, perseverance leading to character, 
leading to hope. It's because of that chain reaction that we can glory or rejoice even, boast even in our sufferings. Suffering is like resilience training. Um, you never develop perseverance unless you have to go through difficulty. And those who do persevere shape their characters in positive ways. Uh, we might say today that that's resiliency or stability. And that whole process trains us to look up, to lift our gaze, to be more hopeful. I want to ask you, what do you think of that? Do you think that's true? Does it ring true for you that people who have suffered more might actually be more hopeful than those who have not suffered? Now, we need to be very careful about making wild generalisations here uh, because even though we're all living through the same time, our experience of COVID-19 is different for each of us. And not only is our experience of suffering different, but we each make choices. Uh, we each have ways in which we engage with the experience that changes, up, uh, changes it for us. And whether we develop perseverance and character and hope actually also depends on the kinds of choices that we make about the suffering we're going through. There's a really interesting piece of research that came out uh, two weeks ago to back up what the Bible says here. And it's research that's produced by McCrindle. Uh, what they did was analyse a whole bunch of Australians from different generations and ask them how they were coping with and responding to COVID-19. There's lots of factors, of course, uh, but the key is that if you're under 40 and you've lived in Australia your whole life, you have lived um, for your whole life in a period of uninterrupted economic growth and prosperity. Uh, it's the longest period of, un of uninterrupted ec economic growth in the world. But if you're under 40, that has been normal for you, even though it is abnormal for most people in most parts of the world for most of history. And because of that, you experience hardship or trial differ differently to people who've actually lived through more. So, for instance, if you are uh, uh, 55 years or older, uh, you will remember, or e even if you're younger than that, if you're a Gen Xer, you can remember the last recession. The boomers can remember the Vietnam War, OPEC crisis, maybe uh, can still remember in the 1950s using uh, food vouchers to shop with. And if you're over 75, uh, you may well remember the Second World War or perhaps even the Great Depression of the 1930s. What difference will those things make to the way in which you experience emotions in COVID-19? Well, this is the way that the different generations have experienced um, or are reporting their experience of COVID-19. And what I want you to notice as you just look at that there is that it's our older Australians who are finding reasons to be hopeful. Do you see that? Uh, the younger generations find all kinds of uh, negativity. Everybody's anxious. Everybody's anxious. It's an anxiety riddled time. But our older generations find in the middle of that reasons to be hopeful. And those over 75, those with the most to lose, those at the greatest threat, are actually the most hopeful. Now, isn't that extraordinary? Isn't that extraordinary? But it's not just that either. Uh, the way that people engage with the experience that they're going through in the middle of COVID-19 is reflected as well. And so if you think of the big, uh, the big changes in our behaviour around self-isolation and social distancing, uh, again, if, if you look at the older generations, can you see that they have found reasons to be positive even in the middle of what's a very negative experience? And so our younger generations are finding just profound negativity, profound negativity. But for our older generations, there's more time to do what they enjoy. And those over 75, almost half of them report benefits 
from more time to do things like reading. People are engaging in the same experience, but very differently. And those who have suffered more and longer are the ones who are finding more hope. Now, that, it's complicated. There's a lot of other things going on as well. Um, but I just want to encourage you that what the Bible says here that at, at first seems so odd is actually backed up by the experience of everyday Australians living through what we're going through right now. And there are a bunch of generic tips which will help all of us to cope better with this kind of experience. So I want to share some of those with you now before moving to, to think just very briefly about what a difference it makes to be a follower of the Lord Jesus in these times. But how do you deal with culture shock? Well, I want to give you uh, six tips uh, that are, are common tips that people um, dealing with culture shock have recommended. Uh, the first is that we need to be realistic. We need to be realistic because um, this is emotionally draining and we won't be productive. And if we think we're going to get the same amount of work done, we're going to be horribly disappointed and we're going to continually be reinforcing a negative pattern of thought in our minds because we can't live up to our own expectations. You will not get the work done that you used to get done. You've lost a whole bunch of competencies and the grief is exhausting. So you need more time to rest and you need to expect that your output's going to be lessened because you're not working in an ideal environment anymore. The second tip is to reduce your stress whenever you can. Um, to, to exercise uh, well, to get out of the house, to, uh, to look at the sky, to find a routine that works for you to break up what could otherwise become an overbearingly monotonous kind of existence. Third tip is we need to limit our exposure. We've got to take breaks from the news cycle, take breaks from the social media. When we were in Namibia, it meant sometimes um, socialising only with English speakers or watching an Australian comedy, going back to something that was familiar for us, but strange to the environment. I reckon now is a good time to re-watch old TV shows, to re-read your favourite books, to escape back into a familiar world that you enjoy and that reminds you that it hasn't always been like this because it won't always be like this. But even in the midst of these times, we've got to take the tip from our older generations that we should look for the positives. At the start of this year, I was worried that I was overcommitted, that I didn't have enough time to spend with my family. Well, guess what? Most of my bookings for the rest of the year outside of college have been canceled and I'm locked in the house with my family 24 seven. So plenty of time with the family and a whole lot less busy. Have you taken time to be thankful for the good things that have come even in the midst of a negative experience? That's a really significant thing to do. Thank God, thank one another, thank your family uh, for the good things that are happening. Fifthly, uh, just keep going, hang in there. Hang in there because if you hang in there today, tomorrow you're going to be able to look back and say, you know what? I got through yesterday. If you just think back to three weeks ago and how insurmountable the difficulties seemed, how on earth would I ever be able to work from home? How would this work? Would the supermarkets ever get their stock back? Would it? And many of the things that we're worried about are now in the rear vision mirror. And just by persevering, uh, you gain skills and confidence to face the next hill as well. So just keep going, just keep going. Sixthly, finally, you need to know that this too will pass. Uh, one of my previous jobs was as a policeman and as a policeman, I was involved in emergency disaster management. And the first rule in disaster management is knowing that no disaster lasts forever everything, it'll come to an end. You remember December, the bushfires? 
They were all we were thinking about. The news cycle was all about the bushfires and it was horrendous. But do you know what? None of them are burning today. The drought in most of the country is broken today. Even these overwhelming things will come to an end and COVID-19, this too will pass. And just knowing that perspective means that you can look up and look ahead and perhaps even with some joy and confidence, think about what comes next. What is it that's going to come next for you? Well, I want to finish just by speaking to those who are followers of the Lord Jesus. Uh, that is, I want to take you back to that passage in the Bible uh, that Lachlan read out for us right at the start, because this is addressing Christians. It's addressing people who believe in Jesus. I just want to read it out to you and see if that sentence that I mentioned fits into the whole much better now. Paul wrote, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. There's so much anxiety and uncertainty in the world but anyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus is made right with God, has peace with him, and never has to worry again about being good enough. That is the sure and certain Christian hope, that no matter what life throws up at us, our hope rests on the glory, the goodness, and the grace of God. It is not about what I might know or be or achieve or amount to myself. So I can look forward then to anything that causes me to trust in Jesus more and in myself less. And guess what? COVID-19 leads me to not trust in myself, leads me to not trust in my money, leads me to not trust in my pleasure or my possessions, but instead to trust in Jesus. So even though it's uncomfortable, even though it is suffering, we can rejoice that it leads us to trust in Jesus. Lachlan, let me hand back to you and we might have uh, time for questions now. Simon, what were some of the main cultural blockers uh, to the gospel, to the message of Jesus in Namibia? Yeah, the, the cultural blockers are interesting. I think um, uh, Namibia, like large parts of sub-Saharan Africa, is animist. Uh, the, the background religions are animist. Uh, and so there's a real openness to the spirit world, uh, to the realities of the world that you can't see and touch. So that's very different from here. Uh, the blocker is that because um, all of that knowledge comes through the elders, through tradition, that those traditions are really hard to break down. Uh, and so often what would happen is um, even as people hear about Jesus, they want to add Jesus on the side uh, to their traditional beliefs rather than uh, to see um, that here is another account of reality, a different account of reality. Thanks, Simon. We've got a couple of questions here um, pertaining to culture shock. Uh, one, how, how long does culture shock last for? How long should we expect to be feeling this way? Um, yeah, I was a bit reticent to actually say this because we're only at the really early days. <laughs> so as we're preparing to go overseas, what they would tell us is that uh, you, you're going to have a period where there'll be a bit of a honeymoon period. And that's mm -hmm. because we wanted to go. So most of us in, in this time didn't get any honeymoon experience. We didn't want it. Uh, and so we immediately went on the downward trajectory. Um, 
that can last uh, for overseas missionaries that that can last up to about two years before it really starts to turn around and so mission agencies that want to work with people long term uh, will largely say uh, you've got to hang in there for at least three years the first time and be prepared to go back before you might make much real traction um, so in our first three years the, the leader of our mission agency said to us before we went, here are the goals. These are your, your KPIs for the first three years. We want you to still trust in Jesus, to still be married, and to want to go back at the end. Anything else is a bonus. Um, so that helps to rewire your expectations. This can last a long time uh, and can be really profound. Um, I think there are differences about what we're going through because we're all going through it together and because there's actually an end point that we're looking forward to. That means that we'll probably struggle with this for the whole time we're in lockdown. And as the, um, as the shackles come off at the other end, we're gonna have a bizarre kind of struggle getting back to the new or getting to the new normal which is not going to be the normal that we had in January. Um, yeah, so different elements of this struggle are going to hang in there for months. Yeah, I guess that's something I hadn't thought about, but in the same way that I'm guessing when you came back to Australia, you would again experience culture shock. When we go back to normal, uh, we'll experience culture shock again in a, a different way. Yeah, so that's actually a phenomenon called reverse culture shock, mm -hmm. uh, and it is our experience and my reading of it um, confirms this, it is more profound and more difficult than the initial one because we expect things to be as we left them. So you are expecting to go back into a workplace that was just like it was in January. And what I want to say to you is that's probably not going to happen or at least not going to happen for a very long time. And so the gap between your expectation of normal and your experience will trigger a whole new set of grief. Yeah. Um, so just to cheer you up completely, I think it's going to be really difficult going back as well. <laughs> okay. I think, uh, one, one last question, and it will kind of combine a, a couple that we've got here. Um, and it's a bit more for you personally, Simon. Um, so has coping with culture shock become second nature to you, or do you still need to work at it? Uh, and maybe how have you coped with culture shock uh, going to Africa, coming back, and now recently with, uh, with COVID-19? Yeah, um, that's a great question or a series of great questions. Um, I think it has actually helped. So um, this is part of the thing with perseverance. Once you've done it once, you can look back and say, I thought that was gonna break me, but it didn't. And here we are again. And so there, there is a, a resiliency that comes from living through things. Uh, and as I've talked to uh, other ex-missionary friends, a lot of them are saying the same kinds of things. We, we actually um, came up with coping mechanisms that we're reusing again. So those six tips that I gave you, these are, well, I was going to say they're not out of a book. There's plenty of books that will give those six tips. But uh, these are the six things that I have found most profoundly helpful mm. for myself, both in Africa but also here in Australia in the last couple of weeks as well. Um, yep, I'm re-watching West Wing with my whole family at the moment. Tips. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Simon. Well, looking at the time, uh, we might finish there. We'll let you go because you, know, you do have a, another job. So thank you very much for uh, being part of Bible Shots today and helping us think through uh, culture shock and how the Bible also gives us really great answers to, to help grapple with the issues that come up. Uh, like I said, if you want to get on the mailing list, uh, please jump on the City Bible Forum website and the Bible Shots page. You can send me an email uh, and let me know that you would like to join the mailing list. Uh, we'll be back next week with our new series uh, with Steve McAlpine, uh, Renovating Life in Troubled Times. And so we hope to see you then. And until then, thanks for coming. We'll see you next time. Thank you.